Welcome to this weekend, Missouri Politics. Right before spring break, legislative uh, session in the heat of the moment, and we had a big retirement this week. Roy Blunt announced he was not going to run for re-election. Here to talk about it is a rising star in the Republican Party, a man with a heck of a feather in his cap, passed one of the biggest education bills, reform bills, House has ever passed. Representative Phil Cristinelli from St. Charles County, welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. Glad to be with you, Scott. Gosh, we got to start off first. Roy Blunt, I mean, when you make your Mount Rushmore of Missouri United States Senators, Thomas Hart Benton, Kit Bond, Roy Blunt, and then you could probably debate the fourth. It's just staggering to think of the people, the miles of road you could drive on in this state, the water you could drink out of, the sewer line that was laid, the, the infrastructure of this state, how Kit Bond handed that baton off to Roy Blunt, and he didn't drop it. I mean, what, a, what an amazing Missouri statesman. Yeah, Roy will absolutely go down as one of the great legends in Missouri politics. Uh, very few people in American history have ever had the privilege to serve both in House and Senate leadership yeah. at the federal level. And whether you agreed with Roy on issues or not, I think everyone understood that he always went to Washington and put Missouri first. And for that, uh, I'm really grateful for his service. There was never a day he wasn't twisting somebody's arm to help some community in Missouri. I mean, look at the NGA just down the street. I, I think you can honestly say that is not there. That is in Illinois without Roy Blunt. And you could go around the state and look at so many things he did. Uh, it really is. I mean, if Kit Bond, you got in the truck and drove around Missouri with Kit Bond, he might not tell you, but if you only knew how, many, how much of that road you'd be driving on with something Kit Bond did, it is an amazing legacy the Blunt family is leaving the state. It absolutely is. Uh, they have put together a political operation that has commanded respect not only in our state but across the country uh, and has really done a lot of good work for the people of this state and the people of this nation. Let's talk about a political accomplishment that you have. Uh, education uh, empowerment scholarships, that, that, you know, I honestly thought that was something that you would never see rural Republicans actually vote for. But you were able to, it, amazing thing, articulate the message. You had to feel kind of like you were working at a daycare, keeping everybody in line, and explaining a very complicated public policy. Give our viewers that may not know what exactly we're talking about just the five cent version of what your bill does. Absolutely. Uh, empowerment scholarships empower uh, parents and students to choose the education that works best for them. And so the way it works is that education assistance organizations, nonprofit groups, will be able to raise money for scholarships that they can give to kids in really desperate situations, so kids that are very low income or have some t sort of learning disability, so that they can all access an alternative school. And that could be a private school, it could be a public school in another district that they would have to pay for. Does that include a Catholic school? It would include a, lot a Catholic school. Lots of St. Louis I know go to Catholic schools. Yeah, I, I went to Catholic school myself, and there's a lot of great Catholic schools across our state that sometimes uh, can meet the, the needs of a student better than this, this district that they happen to be born in. So I see these bills pass sometimes, and I, you know, you go down to Twin Bridges there in Jeff City, but out in the county, one of the places you know you're in the county because they have smoking. How do they know, how does somebody there know about these? Let's say, let's say sure. you're watching this show, you may know how to access if you're watching this show. Maybe you got a, a nephew or a niece in Shelbina, home of Norm Stewart and Cindy O'Loughlin's home county. How could they find out how to, how to access one of these accounts? Well, I think there's going to be three main ways. Uh, the first is the organizations that are raising this money are going to have an interest in making sure that students sign up for the program, and so they're going to be marketing it. Second, uh, the schools that can now accept these students that previously wouldn't have been able to ever afford to attend their institution are going to go out and try to connect the parents and kids with these type of scholarships. And third, the parents themselves I hear every day are desperate for choices. They want options for their kids, and they're looking to the state to obtain them. And, and so I believe that it's not, these scholarships are going to go fast. I don't think that they're just going to sit on the table. Uh, parents want them, and they're going to use them. Do you think, you know, my gut tells me there's a lot of St. Louis, your constituents in St. Charles, St. Louis area folks, maybe in Kansas City area folks, they may be the most inclined because the, the, the larger school options are close together because the urban areas connect a lot of those. I think it may be something that the more people take advantage of, you're right, but it may be more if you want to go to Dexter, it's, it's 30 miles from Sykeston. A little harder to do, but in St. Louis, those options like Nick Shore. His kid goes to school where, where he moved to go to school is very close, which makes it workable for their family. Sure, yeah, and um, we, the other thing that we tried to do to make this bill best for the whole state uh, is that we made sure that the scholarships would only take effect if the state 
uh, significantly increased its commitment to school transportation budgets. And so that was a compromise that I made with many of my rural uh, colleagues that, that felt very strongly that we needed to do more to help uh, their constituents with, with transportation. And so I'm proud that we were able to come to agreement that everybody was happy with. As a kid that rode the old yellow dog 45 minutes one way to Neelyville schools, I am grateful that you could make that trip a little easier on kids. That is something people do not think about. Munzlinger, Senator Munzlinger thought about it. That has been about the only one. <laughs> Uh, uh, next, you know, you're a politician. Now, this is only going to help this, this legislative accomplishment, I'm sure, but you're someone that's talked about as a potential state senate candidate, a person moving up in the House. You chair the very powerful Rules Committee now. Um, it's interesting how in these days and times, people expect to know more about not just the political position, but the personal lives of their leaders. And I was really honored when you uh, mentioned, when you come on and talk about your education bill, that you would share some things about your personal life. And that, that meant a lot to me. You choose to share that with our audience. Sure. Uh, Scott, something that a lot of people know about me, but I never really talked about in a public forum before, is the fact that I'm gay. Uh, I uh, shared that with my friends and family when I was about 16 years yeah. old. Uh, but since that time, it's, it's really just been like a small part of my personal life that I never really advertised much, but also didn't take very many pains to hide. Uh, but I've been dating someone now for about a year, and so I thought it would be uh, important to share that fact with my constituents and the capital community. You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see as a Republican the reaction that I think 99% of the folks are going to be either don't care or very welcoming and encouraging. I'm honored you'd share that. That had to be a tough decision to make internally. I've, I've, I know you've never denied who you were to anyone, never lied to anybody, but sharing that openly has got to be a tough decision. You know, uh, Scott, sometimes we're, we're called to make tough decisions when we sign up for public office. And you're right, people do want to know a little bit more about, about their representative and, and their life and, and their values. And, and I'm happy to share that information. I think it says a lot about not just the Republican Party but um, in Missouri, but also our culture and, and where the, how far the state's come. That, I mean, you're someone that is a, by any means, if you, if you, ordered, if, if you had a new guy that wrote a tip sheet, you'd be a guy that's... Maybe the top contender for that state senate seat, which is a, you know, that's a great, a great legacy. Elman, Dempsey, now Igel. Uh, and I think this is something that's going to not, probably not even factor into the debate. I think that says a lot of very good things about where we've come as a culture. Yeah, I, I think it, things have changed. Uh, they've changed dramatically in my, my own lifetime. And uh, I've never personally uh, felt like my personal life cost me anything politically. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm very blessed for that. Let's talk about some issues. We mentioned Senator Igel. He, he, he took a little bit of floor time this week discussing his plan to kind of, I don't know if it's phase out personal property taxes, but, but, but basically inhibit the growth of property tax in this state. That is something, if you're in St. Louis County, my goodness, you pay some property taxes. Holy cow. Share what that is and what maybe the future for that bill would be if it got to the House. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the House would be very excited to, to take a big bill like that from the Senate and uh, really deliver on the promises that we made to our constituents when we ran for office. Um, one of the things that I admire about uh, Senator Igel and why I worked so hard on his first and second campaign uh, is that he was very clear he wanted to go to Jefferson City to reduce the size of government and cut people's taxes. Uh, and the thing that was different about Bill is that he actually went to the Senate and started doing those things. Uh, and so uh, I think that there are many people in the House uh, that want to deliver on those type of promises that we have made to our folks back home. Uh, and so I, I hope that he does send us a bill. The reason I've enjoyed getting to know you in Jefferson City is you're a serious person. Some people do press release stuff, and every politician has to, has to, has to play politics. And it's naive to think they don't. But you, you do the math. If you do phase this out, how are you going to pay for schools? I mean, that's where most property tax money goes. Sure. Uh, you're going to have to find offsets. Uh, Missouri yeah. is somewhat unique in having this particular type of tax structure. And there are states across the country that have made it work uh, either through their uh, other sales taxes, other fees. Um, you have to find a way that uh, you can't pull the rug out from an established system. You have to find a, an off-ramp such that uh, everybody's needs are still met and the state can, can pay its bills. But uh, some of these really uh, unique and particular taxes can be reduced when they're so burdensome on, on the average taxpayer. Now, I've had this conversation so many times. People will pull me aside and they'll be like, now seriously, do you think the election was stolen? And these are serious people. They mean it. They have suspicions, right? I personally don't think the election was I think 
it may have been a little sloppy, but I think the person that got the most votes won the election. But there's a lot of folks that have real concerns. And there's some bills moving that might try to tighten up Missouri's election processes. I think it's, it's always comical when we worry about other states. But here in Missouri, what are some of the things the House is working on to tighten up our elections? Sure, Scott. And no matter what you believe about the 2020 election, and I've had many of these conversations with my constituents, uh, what is important to me is that the average voter, the people back home, yeah. have faith and confidence that our elections are being run securely. And in many ways right now, they, they simply do not. Uh, and so the, there's a bill moving through the House, uh, and we've done this many times before, but we have to do it again to require photo IDs when people go in uh, to the ballot box to make sure that they are who they say they are. Uh, there's some things that we're taking care of as far as it dealt with mail-in ballots. Uh, mail-in ballots were perhaps necessary uh, when, we, when we had the COVID crisis, but uh, I think generally it's a good practice for people to vote in person, and so we're going to try to encourage that uh, as much as po possible. And um, the goal of this bill is to make sure that everybody walks away from the election feeling like it was fair. So the last thing, we're going to have Jim Murphy on, the quote machine, the greatest quotes <laughs> in Missouri politics. Uh, he's carrying a bill about shutdowns. Mostly, I mean, you could, we could say it, but it's, it's pointed at St. Louis County. Sure. Uh, what should be, take, take all hyperbole out, what is the best public policy for, you, you probably have to have some mechanism to have some of these lockdowns, but what is, the, what is the right mechanism for a county to go through before they do a shutdown? Yeah, uh, and I've worked with uh, Representative Murphy on this, and he deeply cares about making sure that his constituents uh, have access to, to the basic public services like restaurants and, and uh, entertainment, and uh, that is something we absolutely must do. And I think that we've really found a, a good compromise here, and that is the, the executive branch of your county can take certain unilateral actions in order to protect the public health, but they need to go back to the people's legislative representatives, their county councilmen, and get approval for that on a very regular basis. Because if the people uh, don't have an avenue to uh, outlet their support for a different path, uh, then they become very frustrated. And so uh, having that accountability, having that separation of powers and that balance of power, I think is really the answer to the, the problem. And I think that Jim uh, is getting really close to achieving that. Representative, I'm honored you chose our viewers to come and share things with, and I'm always appreciative of you coming and share your views on this week in Missouri politics. Thanks for having me on, Scott. We'll be right back. That quote machine himself, Jim Murphy from South County, will be on our opinion maker panel after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work. Welcome back to Weekend Missouri Politics. Ryan Hawkins, Democratic Strategist. Welcome back to the show. Good morning. Peter Meredith, one of the most quotable men in the Missouri House of Representatives. <laughs> Welcome back, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And the St. Patty's Day tradition, we have Peter Meredith and Jim Murphy. Speaking of quotable men, thank you for coming back, sir. Thank you for having me. And the Dean of the Missouri Republican Party, David Barklage. Uh, David, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. I wanted to say something in your last segment uh, about uh, uh, the representative coming out. Uh, it's something to one, tell your family or tell your friends, but to be a Republican elected official and to come out on TV is, um, uh, is very brave and kudos to him and, and yes. uh, 
let everybody embrace him and let him know that that he is always accepted. As I, he always I, has been. I have I've had an admiration for Representative Chris Lee for a long time, yes. but uh, it certainly grew this morning. David Barglage, uh, it's it's uh, you you wouldn't think it'd be this fun politically already. I mean, it's just St. <laughs> Patty's Day, but here we are, Senator Blunt. Let's talk about him first. Uh, uh, one of the most remarkable statesmen delivered so many much money to this state for Republican, Democrat area, it didn't matter. He really built a lot of the infrastructure of this state. Look, there are two kinds of senators, those that talk and those that do, and he was one of those ones that do. Uh, you have all the rank partisanship that would divide us, yet Roy Blunt was in every negotiation yes. rather than a microphone. And you can't find a road, a bridge, a school, or an institution that wasn't benefited by him fighting for Missourians. And you can put it in crass terms and say, well, those were earmarks of this or that, but it benefited the people of this state. Doesn't matter people in Fredericktown. And candidly, it's a lot easier nowadays to be an ideologue and to have everybody love you for that than be a guy who actually made government work. And he made government work in the House as a leader, in the Senate as a leader, in Missouri as a leader. He is responsible as much as anybody for the majorities that we had in the House and Senate. And he never took a bow, he never took credit he will be sorely missed. You know, Peter, uh, you're a person that only cares about actual government working. And take the votes aside, mm -hmm. because I understand people have honest differences on those. In the back room, he delivered for this state. Yeah, you know, it, uh, I hate to agree here, but it, he was an excellent statesman. It gets easier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and ideologically, I, I might have been extremely upset with him on a regular basis. Sure. But he, when it came to constituent services, he was there for people. Yeah. And when it came to putting Missouri interests first, I think that he did a great job of that. Now, Jim Merville, let's talk about the race to replace him. Uh, with him out, the first person I know that's made serious moves to get in is Eric Schmidt. Right. Uh, it appears as though he's, he's in the race. You have former Governor Eric Grydens. Looks like he's, you know, he's kind of in New York, but he's dying to get back to New Madrid and run. Uh, you've got uh, your Congresswoman Ann Wagner, Jason right. Smith, my Congressman, talking about it, and even Mike Kehoe still in the discussion. And isn't it fun? Isn't <laughs> it fun for me? I, Maybe I, a little challenging for you. I, I think it's great for the Republican Party that we have so many qualified people to do this. That's true. I mean, you know, it, the, a, a small bench is really the worst thing that could happen to a party. We've got genuine. Uh, superstars that can go for this, whether it be Keogh or Smith. I think Smith's probably got the the upper hand. I, I applaud uh, the Secretary of State for sure. saying, you know, I'm not going I gonna... actually believed him when he when he gave his reasons why he wasn't running. I've never really believed... So he could have had this seat. Oh, absolutely. But he, when he said he didn't want to run for it, I kind of believed his reasons. It was an odd thing. It's his family. Yeah. David Barklage, uh, you have seen more of these than anybody else I know. You saw 92, which was a blood fight. Mm -hmm. uh, are we heading toward a blood fight, or is it going to be Greitens versus somebody else that's not No, the, the, dy the, the dynamics are different. One of the most important things in a race like this is how early uh, that the vacancy becomes open. When a vacancy comes open late, as when Matt Blunt uh, decided not to run for governor, you have mm -hmm. very little time for people to react. So they're out staking land, taking territory, everything else. In a situation like this, you have plenty of time for everybody to assess, to meet, to talk, to determine their strength, and for the herd to be thin to where I think you'll have a consensus way before filing starts. And so to that extent, I think you will have a very unified front. People know on the Republican side what is at stake, and so I think that they will work together to come up with one strong nominee. I, I, so I have to laugh. I, I, I don't mean to jump in, I, but I'm going to sit over here with a bag of popcorn and watch the Josh Hawley, you know, QAnon side of the Republican Party fight among themselves and coalesce around a governor who you guys might say he was canceled. We think it's a consequence that he, you know, did what he did. So for, for a Democrat on our side to watch the Republican, it's not going to be kumbaya. I think it's going to be a bloodbath, and I'm going to love watching it continue to push farther and farther and farther to the right. Wishful thinking. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I get the Holly. popcorn side of it, but I'm also terrified of the, the race to the furthest right. Oh, it's, I mean, we, we already see that with Eric Schmidt in his time as AG, uh, pushing things like the China lawsuit, the, fighting to kill the ACA, or even the, the, the Texas lawsuit. I mean, I, I see a guy that we used to think was a moderate, fighting to be further and further to the right. And if that's what this primary looks like, it's not going to be good for Let's the Let's take a second, though. Scott Sifton's in the Democrat side. Mm. Uh, when you thought it was against Roy Blunt, look, I, I think if mm. Roy Blunt came to the Republican primary, very, very hard to beat with Joe Biden in the White House, Democrats controlling Congress. However, you take, if it is Eric Schmidt, very hard to beat, Ann Wagner, Mike Kehoe, 
if it's Eric Greitens. I know when people talk about religious issues and integrity, most of them, we all roll our eyes, and most of them don't mean it. They're just full of the hot air when they talk about religious values. However, some Republicans actually do. Uh, Humphreys is one that comes to mind. Actually means it when he talks about those things. They're not going to vote for the guy that ties the woman in the basement. They might vote for the woman. They're going to vote for the top law enforcement officer over the guy that's been arrested so many times he doesn't take his mugshot anymore. What if you do? Democrats do get that golden ticket. It is grads and it is a 50-50 shot. Well, I, I worry still with him as the nominee, but I do think it gives us a better chance to does, make do, the case that we're, not, away that we're not the crazies here. Sorry? Do, do they take it away from Sifton? You know, I'm not sure it's Sifton's to begin with. Uh, I think he's probably the most credible candidate in the race sure. right now. But we don't know who all is going to get in. And I, I, I would, for one, want to be cautious in suggesting that it, that it is. Assuming we get to file into Eric Greitens' files, is Scott Sifton the Democrat nominee? Uh, I don't know if he'll be the Demo Democratic nominee, but he's going to put up a tough fight. Yeah. He's That's going to run no matter what? Scott Sifton? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. Going to be Sifton? I think so. I think he's left enough. I think he's voted again for killing so many babies and taking so many guns away that uh, he'll do just fine. Who's going to file, David Barclay? <laughs> on the Scott, Republican side. On the Republican side, Eric Schmidt for sure. I think Eric Greitens will test the waters and then step back out. Really? Uh, and so I think it's, it's Schmidt. And then you've got, you know, Jason Smith and Ann Wagner and John Bruner, a couple John of Bruner. people that are all very seriously considering it. I think they're going to determine whether or not uh, that they su can support Schmidt or, or stand down. What happens? I think it'll be Eric Schmidt. And Eric Greitens? And, and Eric Greitens, but I, I agree. I think he'll back out. I, I think it's going to be Schmidt Greitens. It's going to be interesting. Ryan's going to eat a lot of popcorn watching I'm going to eat a lot of popcorn. But one, yep. I do want to say one thing about um, Roy Blunt, if I can. Um, he also emceed the inauguration in D.C. Sure. Mm -hmm. After a tumultuous mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. that, that to step up and say, I'll be the person that, that does this and honors the tradition regardless of party, I thought that was a, a big move. That's who he is, Niangua Pride. Uh, let's talk about uh, your bill. There are public health departments here in St. Louis County. Pretty aggressive moves, maybe the most aggressive in the state. Right. Uh, you've got a bill that would push that back. What would be, I, I guess everybody says if there is a situation, you should have some way to lock people down, I, theoretically. But what, what does your bill make you have to, hoops you have to go through to actually do that? Well, here's what happened. St. Louis County came out with 480 pages of regulations to, to control COVID, and it in included all types of shutdowns. Those 480 pages of, of rules, regulations, and laws had consequences. They had financial consequences, and there was criminal uh, uh, penalties on some of them. They were all made out by one unelected person who was in a, in a, uh, a job that she wasn't even the person. She was there on a temporary basis. They had, she made up 480 pages of laws without one legislative body that was elected. Will your bill make that go through a legislative body? Absolutely, it requires that it goes through the, through the legislative body, the local legislative body, which would be the council here or, or uh, the board of governors or wherever in, in, any, in any of the other counties. But we've got to keep it local and we've got to have oversight from people that are elected. And the thing that was missing in all of this is public uh, input. When a, when a board, uh, when one person makes a rule, never goes to the public and says, how will this affect you, and has no care about that, that's wrong. The people that are elected are the ones that need to have Peter, this, uh, How should this be done? Oh, well, you know, I, I, I think we need to refer to the experts, and, and we haven't done enough of that. But from a governmental standpoint, <laughs> what checks should you go through to do a lockdown? Or a mask order or well, whatever. Well, I think it depends on the case. Uh, sometimes we have to act fast and we have to rely on people who are put in those positions uh, with the expertise so and the knowledge to make decisions. So should have an open like with COVID, the, uh, one person can make a, de a decision sometimes, unchecked, open-ended. Sometimes, but it's not unchecked because the fact is the, the elected folks can step in and override them if necessary. If we'd had a state that came in with leadership, with a governor that, that provided guidelines, a uh, governor that would actually... Would you like the guidelines the governor from Bolivar would have put on? Might have liked some of them if he'd done something. Uh, but the fact is he did nothing. Don't you think the people but, in St. Louis are very happy with the mask orders and the lockdowns they had? And the people in St. Clair County would have shot at you if you'd have tried to make them stay at their house. Well, I think there's truth to that. But the fact is we needed masks across the state. And not having them across the state caused a problem for everyone, even in those places that well, had Well, you could have Governor Cuomo and be a lot, you know, be a good time to be in the gravedigger business. <laughs> I'm not going to go What do you think? There. I mean, what should, what, what, how should you I, lock people down? I, I, well, first of all, no one likes it. Right. right. And that's the thing that it gets, there's a line that gets drawn and 
<clears throat> with all due respect, it's, it's that you don't like the lockdown. Well, nobody likes a lockdown. But when you're acting in the middle of a global pandemic and someone says we have to do something because we're getting no guidance from the federal government or the state government, so it goes to one person that apparently has to write these regulations, the burden is put here to say, well, okay, I'll, here's what I think, and throw it out there. We were acting in a, in a, nobody knew what was going on. We were talking about this earlier. It's the fear of the unknown, right? You, you, and, and I said this from a long time ago, people were scared to make a mistake. Of and, course. and so from a lockdown perspective, look, these things save lives. I mean, we know this, it's not hard. We're not asking you to, you know, shove a can of green beans up your backside. We're asking you to wear a mask. We're asking you to stay home. The economic disasters that's happened from it, we've got to but figure out a way to come back. Telling, right? That's different. Uh, you're, you're told to wear pants every day, aren't you? I mean, the fact is, government has well, said articles, <laughs> articles, <laughs> articles, but no shirt, no shoes, no shirt. Uh, this one says if you're a Republican, you got to wear underwear every day. Uh, let me let me say, my bill doesn't in any way prohibit the, the local uh, health authorities from doing anything. For 15 days, they can do whatever they want. Right. All it does is has oversight after that, saying share the information with us. Let's make sure it's right then we can sell it to the public. And if you're exactly right, they can extend that forever. Right. Prediction time, David Barklage, does a form of this pass? Yes. Your bill pass? Absolutely. This pass? I expect something will. Something will, yeah. I think so too. I think if you keep it local though, you're gonna be in a better spot. Yep. Let me, last prediction uh, around, we have time to talk about it, IP reform. Democrats keep winning these ballot measures. Gonna make it harder to put it on the ballot? I, I think IP reform needs to be very careful. Most major initiatives in the state that have been good, the Ethics Commission, ethics reform, ending the Pender gas machine, term limits, tax reform were all done by IPs, by citizens. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that we should allow a legislature to control all the determinations in this state. Now, constitutionally, I believe in raising the, the thresholds, but I do not believe statutorily all we're doing is making it so billionaires can pass it and take it away from people. <laughs> well, with a minute left, this legislature will decide who won the week. Well, I hate to say it, but, but Eric Schmidt, you know, <laughs> he's positioned himself for the U.S. Senate, and uh, he actually did something good for a change this week. Who won the week? I'm going to say the Missouri House. This week, we probably did something that's unheard of. We passed five different major bills. Guns and abortion? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> what do you got? I, I think, number one, Roy Blond, and two, I have to tell you, my conversations with several Republicans looking at that seat, Yep. John Brenner cared more about the right person running than him running, and the same thing I heard from several congressional members. They care about the party and the country before their own ambition. So I'm going to go. I'm going to take two things. I'm going to congratulate Roy Blunt on a, sure. on a wonderful career, but I'm going to say the Democratic Party won the week because we didn't slam our hand in the door mm -hmm. at the at the minute that he announced he wasn't running, and we're going to let the Republicans, you know, fight it out. I'm going to say Senator Dave Schatz worked very hard on a gas tax proposal. If you if you get outside 270, you've got to do something to to fix Missouri's roads. It's the kind of thing adults do. Dave Schatz stepped up and moved something through the Senate. At a great credit to him. And I'll just announce here, you're going to be our Statesman of the Year. March 30th is going to be our banquet in Jeff City. Uh, please come join us honoring a, a statesman that really earned his spurs again this week in Dave Schatz. We'll see you in two weeks after spring break on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank.